Hi, we're about to enter into Luke 22 and 23, Luke's telling of the passion and crucifixion of Jesus. So before we do, I'm offering this introductory video to give some shape to these two chapters. There's so much going on here. It's really important for listeners or viewers of these videos who may have in their mind a, a complex version of Jesus' story that's an amalgam of all four Gospels, along with some legendary materials, as we also often have with the Christmas story. Um, I hope you can listen carefully as we go through these to exactly what Luke is doing and how that's different than Matthew, Mark, and John offer their version of the story. We'll, of course, look at those details as we go. But I want to offer some overview so we can get a sense of what Luke's doing as we enter into his version of the story. So as you can see on the right side of the screen, titled an overly simplistic comparison of each evangelist's purpose, because plainly I can't summarize each of their author's views in one sentence. But if I have to do that, which I'm doing here, just to give a schematic sense of it, here are the different four different purposes so we can hear what Luke's about. Mark, uh, as argued by Ched Myers decades ago, was writing to prepare Jesus' followers during the Jewish-Roman War from the years 66 to 70 of the Common Era for the violent rejection they will face if they stand against the temple system and its Roman sponsors during the war. Obviously, Mark's purpose was to last beyond just those immediate uh, situations in the year 70, but it certainly set up Jesus' uh, followers for facing that kind of rejection. And it ends on the dark note. There's no resurrection stories in Mark. They're simply an empty tomb and the fear and awe of the disciples who were told to go back to Galilee. Uh, Matthew, on the other hand, taking Mark as a root, but plainly writing for a Jewish audience within the Jewish prophetic tradition. Uh, we can't say how Matthew saw himself, and it wouldn't be surprising if he understood himself something like Jeremiah, or perhaps he simply understands Jesus as something like Jeremiah, and perhaps he's more like Baruch, the scribe who allegedly wrote down much of Jeremiah's story in the book we call Jeremiah. Baruch's a character in that. Uh, to show that Jesus is the expected Messiah, and his rejection by the temple elite echoes the rejection of Jeremiah and other prophets generally before the exile six centuries earlier. So trying to explain for his audience um, why it went down, and also the uniquely math Matthew element later in the first century about people's hearts growing cold, trying to get them to be re-inspired to follow Jesus uh, and not be discouraged. Uh, John, uh, different obviously in the synoptics at many levels, but here one of the scenes that is common to all four Gospels, but portrays a cosmic battle between the representatives of the evil one, represented by the temple and the Roman elites, and God's representative himself, in which the light shines and the darkness cannot overcome it. And we see that there in the language of father in John, so his opponents serve their father, the devil, and Jesus serves his father, the creator, God. And then so in that context, we hear Luke continuing to write to his audience of young adult Romans to convince them that Jesus' way, which will be the key, the key word for uh, what scholars often uh, rather lazily, I'd suggest, call Christianity, although Luke doesn't call it that. He simply calls it the way of Jesus. Um, that Jesus' way of opposing imperial violence, um, propaganda and violence with nonviolent divine love is the true way of peace, unlike the Pax Romana slash Pax Deorum, and plainly meant to be a model for others. And Luke, who we see in Acts of the Apostles, has some kind of close relationship with Paul. We don't know if they really knew each other or if he's just, just a literary relationship. But plainly, Luke uh, is influenced by Paul, as we'll see when we look at Acts, uh, about that way of peace that Paul and Barnabas and Silas and others will declare all over the Mediterranean uh, Roman Empire. So that's some sense of this. And notice what none of them are about here. None of them are about proving doctrine or dogma that's based on later questions of how, how human is Jesus and how how divine is he from a Christological standpoint or from a much later standpoint a view that was never even considered for a thousand years so-called penal substitutionary atonement from Anselm uh, a, a British uh, Christian in the 11th century who tried to get uh, Jesus, um, the understanding of Jesus' death to conform to the medieval world of his time, and sadly has continued to exercise influence a thousand years later, even though that whole notion is utterly foreign to all the Gospels. As countless scholars have written, but that it hasn't stopped popular piety from uh, wildly trying to force the Gospels into the theology, rather than shape a theology based on the Gospels. Um, I'm not here to do theology, I'm here to do exegesis which is to help understand and shed light uh, on the meaning of these texts and not to try to fit them into anybody's particular Christian or other uh, scheme. So I hope we can all do that and listen to what Luke's trying to say, putting aside our presuppositions about the Gospels and putting our side, aside our theological presuppositions
questions that Luke may well not have shared. Um, so as we do that, let's look at the shape of these chapters. And I've highlighted this in a couple of ways. Here's the overview, something like a table of contents. And you can note on this chart, a number of times I put in italics a chiastic shape that either fits the immediate passage or a wider section, um, as here the immediate passage, but here um, also this wider section here of 26 all the way through 49. Uh, and that's unique to Luke. It's not that other gospels don't use chiasms. And as I wrote in my book, Becoming Children, of God now 30 years ago. All of John's gospel is a series of interlocking chiasms and, over, and uh, overlapping as well as interlocking chiasms. Uh, but Luke's shape allows him to shape it the particular way he does. So just going over this briefly to see some of the things that you might recognize are unique to Luke, but to highlight that as we go. Plainly, they all have a preparation for Passover, and in this video, I'll show a brief comparison of Mark and Matthew's to Luke's. And they all have a Last Supper. Um, but only Luke has the argument about the greatest uh, at the table there and ruling over the 12 tribes in response to the greatest. They all have the predicting Simon's denial, Peter, Simon Peter's denial, but only Luke has the two swords and the two swords twice. The question of you must now buy a sword and the question of two swords at the arrest. Um, only Luke has Jesus praying on the Mount of Olives. There's no garden um, as there is in John. There's no place called Gethsemane in, as there is in Mark. There's actually no such place as the Garden of Gethsemane anywhere. That's an example of what I was saying at the beginning of this video, of you having a picture in your mind perhaps that's an amalgam of John's garden and Mark's Gethsemane into the Garden of Gethsemane. But either way, Luke doesn't have either of those things. He has Jesus in prayer on the Mount of Olives, consistent with both the relationship with the Mount of Olives in Luke as well as the issue of being on the mountain back in the Transfiguration in Luke 9. Um, then Jesus is arrested after the kiss by Judas, and there are details that are unique to Luke, although obviously he's arrested in all four. And Peter denies in all four, but there are also unique elements there. Jesus is mocked and questioned and brought before Pilate and Herod in all four Gospels, but differently here. And as we'll look at in just a moment, uh, Luke has an interesting way in which Jesus' opponents keep shifting uh, who they are along the way. So we can't really pin it down, but it'll be interesting to see who it is and who it's not, given who Jesus' opponents were throughout the Gospels. A hint, it's not the Pharisees. And then we see the Via Dolorosa, the, the way of suffering uh, and the cross, all as a chiasm here from 23, 26 to 49. And we'll see that even that chiasm could uh, be continued down to this part if we wanted to. And I'll show that in just a minute. So that's unique to Luke. And let's see how Luke uses key words. I'm not going to go over this in detail, but just to show what those chiasms look like, as we can see. So you can see that the key words, there aren't a lot of key words, but they certainly shape certain sections. So the betrayal here is at the beginning and down here at the middle of this chiasm. I hope you can plainly see this chiasm. I won't go over them in detail details now. I will when we get to those passages, but you can see go prepare the Passover meal and so at the centers where they're doing that. And then we see um, the clear chiasm here as well. You can see the kingdom highlight at the beginning and end, the question of eating and drinking uh, at the beginning and end, and the betrayer in the middle. Um, so we see that in Luke. And then also we see down here um, in Jesus' prayer situation. Uh, and we could also, if we wanted to, I didn't, but we could expand the chiasm to include the surrounding text. Because you can see the sword is mentioned twice here, and the sword is mentioned twice there. Once in the singular and once in plural. And those are the only mentionings, uh, mentions of swords anywhere in this whole section of Luke. As well as uh, a question or a statement made to Jesus with the title Lord. So you see how the, the shape here here forms a chiasm around prayer, but the surrounding element about swords could also be a frame in which the prayer is an alternative to the swords. Now you see how Luke is shaping that so specifically. And then Peter's denial here is shaped uh, in a unique chiastic way here uh, with a servant girl seeing him at the beginning and the Lord turning and looking him at the end and the doubled I do not know. Uh, and so we see a similar thing in chapter 23 that continues. Um, I trust if watchers of these videos know the chapter markers are much later conventions. They're not part of the original, so there's no sharp break in the original manuscript between chapter 22 and 23. It's all part of one unit. And so they arise here, and we see this chiasm in the accusations. They began to accuse and vehemently accusing. Uh, and Pilate um, asks him a question, and Jesus gives a non-answer. And then Herod asks a question, and he gives a non-answer. Uh, then we see how this section is also parallelly chiastic. They brought Jesus to him, and then he hands Jesus back over to them, and it's, it continues with their shouts in the middle and the call to be crucified. Uh, and then 
the big crucifixion scene um, has a very interesting aspects of its chiastic parallels. At the beginning is a man, Simon of Cyrene, and a group of women, the daughters of Jerusalem. And at the end is a centurion and a group of women who followed him from Galilee. And if we wanted to continue, we see that pattern again. A man, Joseph, and that same group of women who followed from Galilee using that exact same phrase. And we see how a number of places there are same phrases used where they wouldn't need to be other than for the sake of uh, creating chiasms. So we see how Luke has shaped this explicitly and we're going to look more at that as we go. A couple of other things that are interesting about how Luke portrayed it. All the gospel writers show controversy over Jesus' title. But for those of us who come thinking the right answer is Jesus Christ, the English form of the Greek Christos, which is the Greek form of the Hebrew Messiah, transliterated in English as Messiah, and think that's the right answer, or that Son of God perhaps is the right answer if you learn it in a Trinitarian sense of, of doctrine. But this is what we actually see. And the one that Jesus uses to refer to himself three times times is the human one, commonly translated as a son of man, but the apocalyptic image that has its uh, source in the book of Enoch as well as in the book of Daniel. And we might not think of it as a title, but it is one who serves. He's come among you as one who serves. So he's a human being and one who serves. The disciples call him Lord and the narrator calls him Lord, but a bunch of other people call him a bunch of other things. And Jesus never claims any of those. He doesn't argue with them. When Herod and Pilate ask him questions about whether he's the Messiah or Son of God, he doesn't disagree, but he doesn't affirm it either. So from Luke's perspective, or maybe from Jesus' perspective, the right answer is human one who serves, not all these other titles. Which is to say, not that they're not true. There's certainly elements in which every one of these is true at some level, and yet that's not what the focus is. So this is how the text presents the question of who Jesus is. This is how it presents his opponents. And we're going to look at that at two levels. Here's who they are as groups. And as I was suggesting at the beginning, no Pharisees, no Sadducees. We only saw the Sadducees once in the issue of marriage in the afterlife where they were trying to make fun of the idea of resurrection. But the Sadducees plainly were not serious opponents uh, for Luke's audience. They don't appear in a serious way in Acts other than as foils against the Pharisees that Paul can side with the Pharisees and split them off in the Sadducees. So this is a focus on the Jerusalem leadership, but is it? So we see chief priests and scribes at the very beginning, you can see it on the left side of the screen, but they're not necessarily a whole unit. The Sanhedrin traditionally consisted of the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. And we only see those mentioned in this one place at the end of chapter 2, brought to the, the council, the only place that Sanhedrin is mentioned. But it's interesting that just two verses after this initial um, naming of the chief priests and scribes, it's the chief priest and the temple soldiers, often misleadingly and anachronistically called temple police, as we have here. Police is a 19th century common era notion that was utterly foreign to the ancient world. And not only to mention, the Greek word is the word for soldiers, not uh, anything that would relate to something like police. So the chief priests and the soldiers, and the scribes seem to drop out, <clears throat> and then there's a crowd, then the chief come back with the chief priests come back with the soldiers, but this time with the elders. But then they're described as the elders of the people. Is that different than the Sanhedrin elders? We don't know because it's an unusual phrase, only there. And so this is the one place where we seem to see them all together when they come to Pilate as an official body. Um, then we, of course, see Pilate, and the ones in bold, not in bold, are simply because they're only mentioned once. Then the chief priests and the crowds are before Pilate, and where are the scribes and the elders at that point? Before Herod, it's him, it's Herod and his soldiers who make fun of Jesus. But then when he's returned turned back over, it's a chief priest, a loose group called rulers and the people. And the rulers are mentioned later in chapter 23, Archon, Archontes. But, but who are they? Are they the same as the scribes? There is no category we know that's simply a ruler as such. Uh, John's Gospel calls Nicodemus an archon, a ruler, but that's because he's a member of the Sanhedrin and a Pharisee. So that's to highlight that as a Pharisee, he happens to be a member of the Sanhedrin. But are these rulers the elders and scribes who are members of the Sanhedrin? It's not clear in both those places. And then finally at the cross, it's the Roman soldiers and then one of the criminals on the cross who opposes Jesus. Um, but that's at the human level, if you will. There's also the cosmic level. And although Luke isn't like John presenting this as this great cosmic battle between God and Satan, although we've seen that before about the house divided, and we'll see about uh, Jesus' clothes being divided, echoing the, uh, that earlier call from chapter 11 in Luke, 
But we see this here. In the beginning, Satan enters into Judas called Iscariot. And then Simon, Simon, listen. Jesus says, Satan is demanded to sift you all like wheat. Um, echoing back John the Baptist saying, uh, even now the uh, winnowing fan is in his hand and separating wheat into chaff. Although he doesn't use it to refer to Satan, he seems to be re using it to refer to God there. And so whether it's Satan sifting or God sifting uh, the wheat from the chaff, here it's Satan. Then a little later in the chapter, when he's in the context of prayer, pray that you may not come to the time of trial, perismos in Greek, which could be translated temptation as well, and recalls Jesus before the devil. And we see that again down here, where the question from the soldiers mocking him, if you were the king of the Judea and save yourself, is much like the question uh, the devil asked, if, if you were the king, would you, or you can jump off this temple and, and God will save you. Um, and so at the end of chapter 22, going back, he says, Jesus says to them, when I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay your hands on me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness, noting the link between the human people and the power of Satan behind them. And then finally, the classic thing from the Arthur Kester novel that takes the title from there, Darkness at Noon came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. Whether we're to understand that darkness as morning, as an eclipse, as a morning, or the power of Satan and the light has withdrawn on, the power of God is withdrawn, we'll have to determine when we get there. Uh, so that gives us some large context. And before we end this overall video, I just want to look at the what we're going to look at in more detail in the next video, just to highlight what Luke is doing here. We won't look at the details now. We'll look at the details next time. So you can see from my uh, code box there, the parts that are bold and black are the parts unique <clears throat> to Mark or Matthew here. Um, parts that are unique to them. The purple is the part that's unique to Luke. The blue is the part that Mark and Matthew have in common, and the plain text is what's common to all three. And so there's a certain amount that Luke has, but notice how Mark and Matthew both have set in the, the scene of the Last Supper. Um, here Mark has it, um, while he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, an anonymous woman came. We saw that back in chapter 7 in Luke. So if, if Luke got it from Mark, he displaced it way back to chapter 7. And we see the same thing here in Matthew 26. In the house of Simon the leper, the woman came. And notice this exact same way of putting that in Mark and Matthew. So Luke has displaced that story. So we already heard it way back in chapter 7 to highlight just what's going on here. And to substitute for that question, the question is we'll see of who is the greatest among the disciples that we'll see uh, in the, after he tells them there's a betrayer. And then we can also see some of the details in purple um, that Luke has added. So we'll look at those in detail next time. So I hope that gives you a nice overview and we'll begin to enter into the pasture according to Luke in our next video. See you then. Bye-bye.